All right, team. How are you this afternoon? <laughs> I'm great. It's great to uh, it's great to be back. And that's uh, we felt that that song would be appropriate to um, you know where we are at currently in all of our lives is you know don't stop believing. Uh, the work that we do is still important, and you know we have families and kids, and many people still depending on us. Uh, so. We just wanted to kind of lead with that message uh, this week, um, you know, and just and this is a you know this is kind of an, an intentional move. That's something that you might want to think about for your uh, for your Google for your Google Meets as well. Is like we kind of like to have this um, kind of waiting area just to let people know that we are here, but we um, are just getting set up and you know kind of setting those boundaries. Uh, for our own classrooms, as well as maybe kind of doing a little bit of of leading in. We usually include like a visual graphic of something that kids can think about. And we might bring that into our community circle or we might bring that, you know, into our math lesson today, just kind of a way to get uh, people engaged in the classroom and thinking. Absolutely. Excellent point. Mix it up a little bit. I know sometimes a lot of teachers in the meets that I've been joining, they spend that time chatting with their kids, which is fantastic. but. Mm -hmm. Every once in a while, it doesn't hurt to uh, mix things up. All right, so we are, uh, this is our weekly session for uh, this week that we are on, and we'll be back again uh, next Tuesday at 3.30. And this is the first time that we've actually done it this way. We're, uh, we're all doing our session at the same time. So we're hoping to alleviate some people's um, scheduling conflicts that they had before, and just we're very conscious of people's time and trying to stay focused on that. Okay, we'll just start with acknowledging that the land that we are connecting from today is part of the traditional territory of the Chippewa, Odawa, Potawatomi, and Delaware nations. And by personally making a commitment, we are taking part in the act of reconciliation, honoring the land and our indigenous heritage. So, so for today. Welcome everybody. Um, Again, thank you for joining us. We know that you have had a long day um, on your computers already, and it's a big ask to have you join us, um, you know, at 3.30 in the afternoon after putting in a full day's work already. So we, we genuinely do appreciate um, what you're doing and as well as like just your commitment to kids. And so um, last week, we spent a lot of time focusing in on sort of setting the groundwork for uh, successfully teaching online. So we, we spent a lot of time helping uh, to provide some examples of things we could do to help, you know, establish routines and uh, build that collective sense of community because with what comes with that sense of community is also a sense of uh, a like mutual accountability, right? And that's something that, um, you know, is gonna be really important going forward for keeping kids engaged and for keeping uh, everybody kind of energized about what we're doing. So. Um, but we, we, we recognize that as we move forward here and last week was more about kind of reviewing content and maybe not accessing new materials just yet. As we move forward, we need to start thinking about um, planning for instruction and planning for new learning. So our, our session today is centered around that idea um, as well as when, you know, is helping to kind of tr transition those uh, those strategies and, and activities that we do in the face-to-face -face environment to the online environment and thinking about what are the right tools for, for doing that and uh, the advantages of some tools versus others. And also what we're going to be thinking about today is, uh, is kind of leaning on um, our virtual learning teachers uh, to help support, you know, with guidance and, uh, you know, ideas from, because they've kind of lived this for, for since September. Right. So that's our plan for today. And I think joining us from today, we have uh, Kristen Heaton and Nastasha Calhoun from the virtual world. I'm not sure if there's anybody else who's joined just yet, uh, just yet, but yeah. Uh, Kristen's here. We haven't, haven't seen Nastasha yet. Uh, welcome, Stephen. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Calhuna, I'm not sure, you know, um, welcome. I'm not sure. <laughs> I want to make sure that I'm saying that right. Um, but welcome for, for joining. That's welcome. Nastasha. Yeah, that's, that's me. Nastasha. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. She's a mystery. She's she's a Calhoun sometimes and she's a oh, lot. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. <laughs> awesome. And she has a little friend with her too. 
Awesome. Okay, so um, Tina and I decided that today we are going to um, step a little outside of our usual comfort zone. And, um, you know, we're going to talk to you about a lot of things, but we want to center our work today around planning and considerations. And um, we chose to do a drama uh, lesson today uh, that we're going to focus on. So there's, there was, there's a lot of reasons for this. Um, so we decided that it's that time of year when folks are thinking about their assessment and their valuation. And we, we kind of wanted to show that the planning format or the planning template, I guess you could call it, that we're going to share today is something that we think you can use for a variety of your subjects. Uh, now, I know that Kristen, she says that drama is right in her forte and her wheelhouse. So uh, we're going to be leaning uh, heavily on her today. So planning considerations, like what you need to start with all the time is the curriculum. And keep in mind, what is it do I want my students to be able to know or to be able to do? I so that is a really, that's a really good. Right to the curriculum. Sorry. Um, yeah, I find that's a really good kind of touchstone, right? Is if, you know, often we get lost in the expectations and we go and like, what does this expectation mean? And, you know, what are, you know, there's a million different things that go into this. But if we kind of like really ask ourselves that question, it helps distill, you know, what is it ultimately that we want our kids to be able to do? And that for me is really like helpful. It helps me focus my instruction. Um, and I think that one of the planning considerations that uh, everyone has kind of been talking about in terms of remote learning is like you, you really got to prioritize and think of kind of like what's most important because of our shortened day and um, you know the fact that things just tend to move slower when we're uh, when we're in a remote environment. For sure. And then from there, once you decide what it is you want your students to do, what expectations you're working towards, you have to be always thinking about what's the final product that you're going to want them to be able to produce. And then from there, we look at what kind of a tool, especially online, what kind of a format, what kind of a tool are they going to use to organize their thinking and actually um, be able to produce the assignment or the work that we're asking for. And the next one is how are then we going to plan to scaffold or build what the students need to be able to get to that end product. And then finally, our assessment evaluation, we're thinking, how are we going to know what the students know? I think those are some key points. And um, I think uh, Kristen and Anastasia, the assessment evaluation online, it looks a lot differently than it did in the classroom. And I think once we can kind of wrap our heads around that, I, I think it'll help with the planning stage. Girls, have anything to say about that? I've been leaning probably more um, almost more on projects than maybe I would have in the classroom. And it is challenging to do group projects. So if you're someone who liked to do a lot of group work, um, that's becoming a bit, you know, it takes a lot more planning than you may have had to in the classroom. Another way I'm using assessment evaluation would be like through Google Forms, right? Like if I just want to check in and see. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm, and I'm finding a lot of my assessments is based on their day to day, like you would in the classroom. But I think I'm leaning a lot more heavily on it than I may have in the classroom. Great points. And I think you have to get your own little kind of personal system in play as to how you're going to kind of document and record all of that so that you can very easily find it and compile it and use it to kind of give an overall evaluation. Yeah, I thought I thought what you said about um, group work being a, a challenge uh, was an important one because you know, often we're not thinking about students might not, you know, some students are accessing asynchronously. Sometimes they're, uh, you know, they have, uh, maybe they're sharing devices and like expecting students to be able to kind of come together at a particular time and work on it all at that time can be um, something that, that doesn't, you know, that can be a challenge. So I, I like that For you sure. brought that up. Okay, so we're now gonna take this to our drama. So um, this is where we started. So we start with what we want the students to be able to do. We went right to the curriculum and we chose uh, expectation two, overall expectation two. And then from there, we went down to our specifics, 
And this is what we saw in the curriculum. And this is what we decided kind of jumped out at us that we thought was what we could get our students to do to be able to demonstrate how they meet these expectations. And a common, um, a common, you know, thing that I've heard a lot of in the last few weeks is, you know, teaching online is a lot of work. You got to do a lot of planning. Everything's kind of got to be ready. I, you know, I'm getting slide decks that are shared to me that are being edited at 1230 at night. And um, so, you know, the, one of the things that we can kind of do to help kind of reduce that workload is when we go to the expectations and having those uh, you know, those sample activities and the sample problems right there for us so that we don't have to go and recreate, you know, the idea or the expectation um, can be something that helps helps us manage the workload. For sure. And, I, uh, you know, they keep telling us that when we go back to our math just for a second, this is coming in our new math curriculum and, and we are patiently waiting for that when it comes. But uh, this is, you know, everybody always says this is one of the things that they found most helpful from the curriculum is the italicized examples that they give or the teacher prompts that were included in the previous curriculum. Okay, so the next I think thing- somebody, Was it Kristen or Nastasha, did you wanna jump in there? I just wanted to chime in really quick um, with sure. talking about the planning and um, how it is a lot of work. Um, I've been finding that creating routines like um, and doing consistent things each, you know, for writing, if you're doing like a, um, so like to-do list Tuesday or like my thoughts Thursday, like things like that, where you're kind of doing the same. I, I find creating those routines, like something consistent each week is, is helpful with planning just because it, it is really overwhelming. Right. So like setting up those structures and just kind of like tweaking things within the structure. Thanks. Good point. Good point. Good point. Okay. So now that we have our um, expectation that we have that the kids are going to do, what do we want our kids to be able to know? And um, so what does the final product look like and determining what tool? So this is where Tina and I kind of sat down and this is what we did. I'm not sure um, if this makes sense to anyone else. Tina and I kind of think a little bit differently when it comes to things like this. So we thought, what do the, we want the kids to be able to make? Well, if they're gonna make that tableau that was mentioned in the previous uh, curriculum expectations, here are some characteristics that it has to have. It has to have a visual component uh, it has to be, it's going to be multi-stepped. That's one thing that we heard last year from, or last week, sorry, from a lot of our virtual teachers is to chunk the assignments. So we're going to do this in a, a variety of steps. Uh, it has to, we wanted to make it individual, which goes back to what Kristen said. We're, you know, we're new at this online thing. We want to, we want to keep the work as simple as we can. So we're going to keep it individual. Uh, we want to have a reflection and a peer feedback component that we're going to add to this assignment. And if it's something that we're interested in, we can always tap into this as some kind of an oral language assessment uh, mark to go with our report card. From here, when we looked at all these things, Tina and I uh, thought, what is the best tool that we can get our students to use for this? And we came to the determination that we think Google Slides is our best choice at this particular time. Uh, we know that it does have its limitations, but we thought we're going to get the biggest bang for our buck from this, and it's going to be one of the tools that the kids will be able to use and be successful with this particular assignment. Right, and I think looking at it from that backward design perspective, right, is that we started with what our need was first, and then thought about, okay, what is the tool that best addresses these needs? From here, uh, we went back to our growing success guide and that triangulation of data is something that we always try and keep in mind that we need to have a combination of observations, conversations, and the products to be able to kind of give an overall mark uh, to, under to get a deep understanding of the child's learning. Um, and, sorry. Sorry, yeah, sorry. Um, something that's been really interesting here is that often in classrooms because of, you know, our demands on like kids, uh, are constantly kind of, you know, looking for our attention or they need us, that getting those observe, getting those conversations can sometimes be challenging in the classroom. And what I'm seeing that's really cool in remote learning is that sometimes getting those, you know, capturing those conversations, those learning conversations is actually easier in the online environment. My wife's been, uh, meet, my, my wife's been meeting with kids in um, small groups and one-to-one -one kind of breakout sessions with students. 
and she's able to she can record them so that she can go back and look at them for her DRAs. She um, one thing that she did today was she worked with a student on a on a task and she did the same that thing that we would do in the classroom was she was scribing for them. Right. So um, really kind of like taking the tools and the advantages of remote learning and leveraging those to get those things. Cause often in the classroom, we're very, we're very comfortable with, with products, right? We trust the product shows the learning and we maybe don't, we aren't as comfortable with like valuing or using conversations and observations um, as, as weighted as, as products are. Um, so those, those were some neat things that, that I've found uh, so far this week. And I think it's important, and this is where we're going to tap into our virtual teachers, getting yourself some kind of a system for recording this. So how do you, like in a classroom, you'd have an out-of-glance sheet, or you'd have a you, on your iPad or your device somehow that you would record any kind of a conversation or a check-in that you would have had with a student, something you observed the student doing. We're just wondering if um, any of our virtual teachers have a kind of a go-to that they find helps them really keep this information uh, at their fingertips and organized? Well, one way I converse, because I mean, obviously it's easier with older students is to do it within their work, like on Google Slides, for instance, and put it in the comments section. And then we have a dialogue back and forth. And then I also don't have to keep it somewhere else, mm -hmm. right? So then I'm not, so that's one way I'm doing it within like the feedback, for instance, for their actual assignments. And then otherwise I'm doing it old school on paper. <laughs> so, yeah. Sometimes that's the best tool. I'm the same, Kristen. I'm a paper person. I need it, you know, on paper in front of me. So um, the same way, but I find, I do find like recording those, on, like using whiteboard F by and just, you know, even just giving a quick math question. And then it's so easy to just quickly save that and then go on to the next question. You could just save it and you, it's so easy to refer back to it. Um, everything's just recorded and everything's there. And, you know, you could choose to go back or not to go back. So I do, um, I do really enjoy that part of it. I'm glad you mentioned about the, uh, the whiteboard part and about the uh, putting comments on the Google Slides, Kristen, because that's one of the reasons why Tina and I thought Google Slides was a good tool for this particular assignment, because it's a way that you can give them feedback and then you can see if they've acted on it. And it's also a way to be able to keep it documented and it's all in one spot. And, and one of the challenges that we've talked about um, in, and often like, you know, intermediate is, uh, you know, engagement is an issue, right? Or is, is keeping students engaged. And I know for, from my own experience, right, is that if I get feedback or if I get a notification that I've got some feedback on something, I'm jumping on there right away and I'm looking. And, um, you know, that, that's also like, you know, it's a, it's a tool for um, helping to improve student learning, but it's also a way to keep kids engaged. Um, and, and yeah, I think that that's, that's a good idea. Awesome. Okay, so if we're moving forward now, and by the way, if uh, any of our folks out there, type your questions into your chat, unmute your mic. You know, we, one of the reasons why we love having our virtual uh, folks here is because they're right handy for our Q&A session and if you have something that you're struggling with bring it forward and I'm sure that they've either encountered it or heard somebody else encounter it and they might have a way that we can kind of work through it. Okay so then the next step that we decided to go on Tina and I was we looked at so now that we have our expectations and what they're going to do and the tool that we're going to get the students to use to be able to demonstrate it what processes or scaffolding are they going to need to have to get through this particular assignment. And in a couple of minutes, we're gonna actually jump to the Google slide that we created to show you some of these steps that we're talking about. And that will definitely be shared in our show notes uh, at the end of the session. But uh, so here are some, these are basically how we broke down our assignment into the different stages, the different parts that the students are gonna be working through. So we start with a notice and a wonder to kind of engage them, get them thinking, get them thinking about all of their senses and how that's going to relate to this particular assignment. Uh, we're going to have them brainstorm some of their ideas. Uh, we're going to choose a different perspective, and this will make a little bit more sense to you once you see the actual assignment. They're either going to take it from the perspective of a child in the neighborhood or from an animal that lives in the uh, woodlot. 
And then they're going to do some character analysis, again, looking at feeling, kind of getting in touch with the senses, uh, what it looks like, feels like, sounds like, things like that. We'll have some um, examples too, hopefully, for our character analysis, where we get them to jump on the Google Meet for that particular lesson to share their thoughts. And um, then the uh, Tableau is going to be the final product where they're going to actually work on their images for that. And then uh, there's a rubric. And then there's going to be some peer, back, peer feedback, excuse me, and some reflection time. So this, you know, this particular assignment could take, uh, you know, a, a two weeks for us to get through from beginning to end. And I think um, virtual teachers help us out. That was the message that we kind of heard loud and clear last week was that you break it down into chunks, take it really slow, be intentional with your teaching and, and let them work at their own pace. Does that sound right, Don, Natasha? Yeah, definitely. I think, um, I feel like things do take quite a bit longer um, virtually than they would in the classroom as well. So um, the chunking is definitely necessary and seeing where they're at and where to go next. Another reason that we selected Google Slides um, as a tool here was also because this because this assignment has multiple components, we felt that the Google Slide helped kept keep them organized as well as that all of their information would be in one place. So they're not jumping from here and there and everywhere or like, I don't know where I put that. So um, we felt that that would be something that would be supportive. And to be perfectly honest, I do most of my work in Google Classroom, like in Google Slides. Most almost every subject, almost every activity. Right, it's, it's just so and versatile. We, we kind of got that idea from you folks at the beginning of the year, you mentioned how you kind of think of a Google slide deck as their notebook. So uh, we're gonna jump, I think right now team to the actual uh, deck. So if we could get the link shared in the chat. I'll share that right now. And then, um, so basically each child, we would push this out in our Google Classroom and we would share with each child uh, one of these. So basically each child's gonna get their own copy and they're going to consider this their drama notebook. And my internet's being very slow today. Knock on wood, at least it hasn't kicked me out. Had that problem a couple times. Okay, so um, th again, this is just a deck that Tina and I made up. So this would be a, a shared deck that um, you would share it with your students either via Google, uh, Google Classroom or um, if you just wanted to do like a, a forced copy, mm -hmm. depending on how you wanted to structure it. And again, one of the things that we talked about while we chose Google Slides was because it's always kind of like a live document. So if you have a master slide deck that's yours as the teacher that has everything that you want in it, you might only release a certain amount of those slides to the students. And then you can always go back in and add more uh, to the slides to the deck uh, once it's that time. So here would be the first page, which is kind of like our little table of contents. So things are kind of itemized out for the students. And um, this is how we kind of had it organized. So we would start with um, this particular slide here. And then we would share with the students the fact that we're going to show you a picture. And from this picture, we want to know, what do you notice? What do you wonder? So we're not really giving them the full assignment criteria yet or the expectations yet. We're just building kind of like their scaffolding and engaging them in it. So as this a teacher, a I might have a whiteboard open right now and I might be writing down some of their thoughts. And um, they could be doing the same thing down below. Google Slides, you can either create a text box and they could be typing on their own slide or there's always that speaker notes option at the bottom or they can be adding some of their own thoughts. And this goes back to uh, something that Kristen and, and Nastasha talk, spoke about as well is, is like creating those routines, right? It was that the more you do the same thing, the more kids know what the expectation is. So like this is a really powerful routine that you can use in math and science, um, you know, across the different uh, subject areas and um, you know, get kids thinking about what it is that we want them to know. This is where it's, this is also very formative for us, right? Is that 
um, what they tell us tells us their current level of understanding. So we can use that as a baseline to move forward. So the first one was from the, the child's perspective. And then we give them a little bit more information. So there's a new playground in your neighborhood, but also where there currently is a woodlot. And then we would have probably a conversation about that, because depending on where the students are from, a woodlot might not be a word that they're familiar with and really understand. And then we would show them this second photo and ask them again, what do you notice? What do you wonder? Just to get their thinking kind of, kind of going. And then from here, uh, we then would show them both and now consider any thoughts that they have if you combine them both together. And finally, we get to our actual what their assignment is going to, to be. And um, so one of the expectations in the curriculum is kind of this whole thinking about others or thinking about where you fit into the world globally. And one of the reasons why we, we like this particular assignment, we thought, because it, it really forces the students to really think about the perspective of other components that are in the world functioning at the same time. It's also an assignment that we felt um, just kind of like where we are in terms of our, uh, you know, with kids in remote learning. It's a task that's accessible to students right now. It's not, you know, it's not. Ter you know, it's not really terribly, um, you know, difficult in terms of cognitively speaking. Uh, there's different ways that kids can get in on this and it really fits the tool that we've selected. And we were, you know, we're, we're kind of just making sure that we're laying that, that foundation of kids getting really comfortable with Google Slides because as we go forward, you know, we can introduce new features and we can start kind of overcoming some of those th limitations of Google Slides. For example, like um, uh, it's it's not really that user friendly to embed audio from the start, right? But like as we could get more comfortable with the tool and they know the tool, we can say, okay, now if you want to add audio, here's a way that you can get over that limitation or here's a way that you're able to do that. Um, instead of kind of like jumping from one tool to another tool to another tool, really just kind of like staying in one place and learning how we can, you know, most effectively use that, that one tool. That's a great point. And probably there's a lot of students that are going to get in on the whole, um, the, using the Google Write uh, keyboard to help them function when they're typing or the text to speech. I'm not sure, uh, virtual folks, do you know, is there some students that, uh, you know, would, would benefit from that and use that quite a bit when they're handing in their work? We've, we've had um, the AT team do Google Read and Write sessions. And so what, what they find is best is to still do it in a doc and then they copy it into the slide after. So I do have um, a handful of students using it regularly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a good, that's a good tip though, is, you know, if kids are, you, you know, if they're comfortable with using the read and write tools from docs, like do a little bit of app smashing, start it out in docs, do your editing, get it cleaned up and then uh, bring it into uh, Google slides. Great, great tip. And that can help too. Like if you have each slide labeled, like we have part one assignment, that can just be a subtitle that the student puts in their Google doc and then they can keep themselves organized that way. All right, so from here then we thought, if we're gonna have the component of a student feedback, then we need to develop some success criteria and have the kids in on it. So this is kind of the one of the things that we like to get about Google Slides is that it can be a live document. So as you discuss um, things in your classroom and as it comes up, what makes a good tableau, what, you know, what needs to be in there, this can just be added as you work through. Um, and, you know, one of the things we have in here is probably students don't know what a tableau is, or, you know, and it's, there's lots of examples we can find out there. So that could be one little mini lesson that you might start with is what is a tableau and how do you go about making sure it's getting your message across and, um, and, this, and, and being able to, uh, and being able to embed a video, um, is you know is pretty powerful we can grab any video off youtube or upload it from our own google drives um i i know that um there's been some questions around you know how do i link a video or how do i get video and sound to show in uh when i'm in a google meet so 
uh, that this has been kind of one thing that I that I've been talking to teachers about is making sure that that, that video is embedded in the slide and that when you share that you're sharing this tab that's the only way students are going to be able to get the sound on their end. And so then we thought you know what if you're chunking it like that could be something that you're just you know that could be the end of day two there and you might put it away because you're not doing art again for another day or two you put it away or it's there for something that they can always work on if they get some other work done uh finished i've heard that kind of been said quite a bit if you get this done don't forget you can go work on your art assignment so the next thing with page we had was where we had students working on um brainstorming so again to as much help as we can we need to alleviate the friction for students so what we actually did was we created um these little notes here that we made and i'm not sure what's going on it's not gonna let me do it yeah when you're that's the only yeah. thing is that you can't move stuff around when you're in present right. mode which so all these little gray boxes up here they are they all just say uh write your idea here and they're movable so you could just grab one pull it over almost like sticky notes and then the students can just be jotting their ideas down and it helps them to see that those are all different multiple ideas. So yeah, they I've might be Oh, sorry, Denise. I've got a tip for like, cause I work in slides and use it like a whiteboard. And so if you come out of the presentation mode and then you can zoom in a hundred percent and then okay. you can move, move things around still and they'll still see your slides on the side. Right. Yep. But yeah, there's the, Kind of by your arrow at the top yeah you can even zoom in and i do that sometimes when i'm doing a math talk or something okay yep. so that i can write their name and what they're saying and still have it zoomed in enough so they can see but then i can be working right. on it while we're talking about it right mm -hmm. good tip great thank you yes, yeah, that's <laughs> your wealth of experience so brainstorming we want the kids to kind of take a look at so what are some things that you might see here you know, and look at it from both perspectives. If you're going to be the child or you're going to be one of the animals, and, and that might be a little tough for some of our students to be able to put themselves into, uh, you know, an object that maybe isn't human and doesn't have, you know, characteristics that you might be familiar with. Although some kids would be very excited about trying to be a squirrel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it it's, might it's have a work. lot of it's experience. Work for them. Too. We're just saying, yeah, yeah. Great point, great point. Okay, and then that might just be the end of one day, right? Maybe you got 10 minutes, let's go here. Like we're, this is just, you know, this isn't written in stone. This is just how we thought it might be laid out. Part three, we're gonna try and look at some feelings. So if you were a child in the neighborhood, you would probably be excited that there was a playground coming. And this is where we thought, turn on your cameras if you're comfortable with it. Let's everybody show us with your face or stand up with your bodies and show us what it might look like to be excited that you're getting a playground. You know, or maybe you might be one of those students that's a little, um, you know, you like the outdoors and you like to go for walks in the woods. Maybe you might not be excited about the playground. Maybe you're a little sad. Let's show us what that might look like. And then, you know, really kind of step them out of the comfort zone and okay, so what about the rabbits? What about the rabbits that aren't gonna have, you know, their fresh leaves to munch on? How do you think they would be feeling now? And how would a rabbit be able to elicit this kind of a response? And like Teen said, some kids are going to take this and run with it, and some kids are really going to struggle, but that's that's the beauty of this kind of an assignment. And then uh, from here, once they've kind of decided um, whether they want to be the perspective of a child in the neighborhood or an animal in the neighborhood, it's time for them to actually start doing some creating. And I think it's important to mention that all three here, you might be doing a couple mini lessons. Maybe students don't know about uh, foreground and background. Maybe they don't understand that if they wanted to crop a picture of a woodlot behind them, if they're going to be an animal, maybe they want to add that in there. And from here, like you could, maybe they need to go to that remove background website and figure out how to do that in order to make their picture actually express what they want it to be. Uh, there's, you know, ladies help us out here. Did you find there was a lot of little kind of incidental teaching moments that you have along the way? With, with technology or with the workarounds, how you can make this possible? Yeah, it definitely uh, took a while <laughs> to work out all those little um, things, but it's, uh, it's nice once they're all worked out, but definitely a lot of mini lessons 
all, all the time. I'm still doing mini lessons. Like I'll still pull some kids aside to help them through something. Um, if there's only one or two that I'm finding are just having tech issues that, with a certain thing, I'll just pull a, a separate meetup and just pull them into it. Um, but yeah. And uh, I think something I, I think that, you know, is that uh, we're going to look at a little bit later is the rubric, right? So we're going to make sure that, you know, those things that we're asking for, we're expecting students to do in the rubric are part of the success, success criteria, as well as those kind of mini lessons that are progressing towards uh, that culminating thing that we're going to assess. And I think one important point that was made aware to us too last week from our virtual teachers is that when you're assessing, make sure that you're assessing the actual work and not assessing how efficient or inefficient the students are with the tool, which is, I think, one reason why we thought we're going to pick Google Slides. It's, it's quite a popular one, and, and most kids know a little bit about it to get in on it, and it, it's really simple when it comes to just doing what we're asking kids to do, and that way, when it gets to the rubric, we've, we've worked through all those kinks to try and make sure that tech isn't an issue when it comes to actual the product and assessing it. So from here, we would just have students work on. So we said four to seven, I believe, at the beginning of our um, assignment. And um, from here, so at the bottom, now you can't see it when I'm actually presenting too, but at the bottom we have on our speaker notes where we would want students to be able to explain their scene. So up here in this part is going to be pictures and here is scene one. So this will be one of their images. And then down here, we want them to do a little explaining of what theirs, theirs is. And it goes on and we did uh, two, three, four. We did them all the way up to seven for those students that want to do the maximum of seven. I'm, I'm anticipating this is gonna be maybe a little bit tricky because some students, if they don't have iPads, this photo part might be where a lot of them get tripped up. If, you know, Chromebooks, you can take photos with Chromebooks. It's a little bit more um, of an issue and a little bit more um, difficult to navigate through, I think, right, ladies? To be able to have the so Chromebook what, at the right angle. Yeah, so what we found um, with those on Chromebooks is maybe they'll go, oh, I have um, I like a phone or something I can use to do the pictures. And then, so then you're making sure they know how to get the picture from their phone to their Google Drive to then be able to put in the slide deck, which is another great mini lesson. Like, <laughs> don't get me wrong. <laughs> like, it's a, another good way for them to learn. They're right. going to be so savvy at the end of this. Right. So a lot of them are able to do that. Another option you might give is to allow those students who really can't do the picture thing is to do it live in the session mm -hmm. with their with their camera on. Yeah, that's a good option. That's a, that's a great point too. Yeah. And then that way, like that part would just not be in their actual Google slide, but it would be something that everybody right. sees kind of as the live mm -hmm. tableau, which is, you know, typically the way that maybe most tableaus are done is, is kind of a live performance. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and with, uh, with Tina and I actually talked about the phone thing and that's where we said we're kind of fortunate that we have intermediates because, you know, most intermediates these days either have their own phone or have an access to a phone through a sibling or a parent so that they, this might be a way to alleviate kind of some of that stress of mm -hmm. being able to take a photo. Okay. But yeah, getting them to put it to their Google Drive is definitely uh, a mini lesson. Probably something they have to go back to several times. I can't anticipate, right. So um, we thought from here, this is kind of one of those slides that we wouldn't put in right off the hop in the initial deck to the students. We would keep this reflection and peer feedback part. Uh, and we would slip it in once everybody has their photos in because we don't want them to go in ahead of time and do their reflection before they actually have the assignment finished. So um, this is again an area that Tina and I talked about it has to be in the success criteria. You can't expect students to be appropriate and give meaningful feedback if they haven't been modeled and haven't had opportunities to practice. So this might be something that you work on throughout the day in a little activity, little language activity or a little, you know, math activity or something. 
this isn't an issue that they they aren't coming into kind of cold. On. Yeah, and like so much of what we've been talking about today is really just that, that scaffolded learning, right? And just and in the way, when we chunk things like this, we uh, we make it also like we're signaling to students that this is important because we just haven't spent like 40 minutes of create a tableau and walked away is that when we invest time over, you know, over a period and um, do all the teaching that's going to, you know, that's going to be required for kids to be successful with this, they, we signal to them that, oh, this is important. I, I, you know, I should, I should engage in this um, as well as like, this is that this is kind of that piece from this came right from the curriculum as well right so is that when we take things right from the curriculum then it's really easy for us to be able to take that and flip that into a report card comment um because we want to be able to you know we're trying to reduce the workload so if we're writing that success criteria we can take that success criteria from the curriculum and immediately turn it into a uh into a report card comment and if you make the success criteria with the students, it should be familiar when the student actually looks over their report card. It, it, you know, this, oh yeah, I remember doing that in class kind of a thing, right? Right. And, um, you know, this can be, again, a personal thing. You might want your students to put sticky notes or comments on a, a couple of their friends' slides. You might um, have them do it at the bottom in the speaker notes, but use a different color font than what the student wrote their explanation of their scenes on. If you choose to do this as an oral presentation for some uh, language marks, you might have students kind of just draw up a little uh, table on their own slide deck and say, I, I'm going to give some peer feedback to and name some students. Like there's a variety of ways. And I think this is a personal um, kind of personal preference thing. I'm not sure if girls, if you have anything to share about how you, you know, if you give the students to when they talk to one another about their work or anything like that it's like the whole gallery walk thing right like how do you how do we get that message across virtually let students be able to look at each other's work reflect so on i've, I've done a lot of uh, presentations like with science like not a lot but that's kind of how i was getting some marks for my final science right and so they would present to the group and then um really it was like okay who has a question so it was kind of more posed as who is a question or in the chat, they'd be like, that was amazing. I liked this or, you know what I mean? So it wasn't immediately on their work. So mm -hmm. it's not something I have tried, but right. it's been like in a class presentation. Right. So I don't know if Miss Nash has done. And it sounds like it's probably how you've modeled it too, right, Kristen? Like you probably, when you're giving feedback, you, you would model, you know, like you yeah. don't want students to say that was good. I really liked your pictures. You know, yes, I would, I should, if they did say that, I'd be like, why, you know, because then, right. then you throw it back and go, okay, what more can you say? So, yeah. And then go ahead. Uh, we've done a lot of shared. Uh, oh, sorry. I was going to say we do a lot of shared um, slides. Uh, so the students will like I'll have them go back and read through like if they're done something they like can look through uh, other student slides and they'll they'll often give feedback right in the chat and and that's definitely something I, I've modeled as well like how to give feedback and constructive feedback so they're mm -hmm. getting much better at that but um, yeah just with the shared slides they'll they'll look through everyone's work and then they'll ju they'll just on their own in the chat give each other feedback that way um, I did do a writing piece which was interesting with my seven eights. Uh, I did a peer feedback where I, but I wanted it to be anonymous. So I ended up copying, pasting them and giving them numbers and then sending it to that person. So it was a little bit trickier to do with, um, you know, a big writing piece with the uh, intermediates than you would in class where you could just take their papers and hand them out. But uh, um, they did really well with it too. So that's awesome. And that's another reason why, like, so, you know, Google Slide, we chose to do this as an individual project. If you wanted to go the route where you're going to have a group of two or three working on it, they can very easily collaborate on the same deck. Um, you talked about how you just push out the same uh, class deck to everyone. So everyone's slide is the same. And, and you might choose to do, you know, something a little bit different like that. That's um, how, you know, it can be accommodate different needs that you need. 
Uh, so from here, we just thought we'd add a couple more slides. So if the students like to keep some kind of a little dictionary or a glossary, if this is like their notebook, you know, we all have those students that take very good notes and they might want to add to their glossary any words that they have. So we just kind of gave them some pages for this. Um, you might have some students that take their, their little deck here and they own it and they might add a couple of just extra slides so they can just take notes, random notes they might have, or they might have some spots where they're just putting some photos that they're just keeping them there to kind of keep them organized. Um, that's one of the things that I know Todd, he shared last week was he said that some students are, are taking the, the format and changing it and adapting it so it's, it's, it better meets their suits their needs and how they want to push their information back to the teacher. And then the last one we have is um, the rubric and these little green check marks. Now that I know that I can get out of my mode and I can go here. So we thought one cool way might be to have the students, um, I'm not going to improve it because it's going to just get in the way, but they just very quickly can self assess and they can just drag the green check mark over to where they thought they might be uh, based on their self assessment. And that that's another way that is is kind of beneficial for the teacher to be able to um, have that when I find that like, you know, typically when students are doing self assessment they're they're bang on or they're overly hard on themselves. Uh, not very often do I find kids uh, feel that they, you know, they've achieved higher than they, um, you know, than, than what their work indicates. So, uh, and it's a great, like, you know, place to meet and have a discussion about. So we'll talk about this a little bit later when we get into assessment and evaluation is that, you know, if there is a lot of disagreement, uh, you know, in here, we probably do want to have a conversation about why that is. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing that we have kind of on our uh, slide deck that we'll share with you on this one is just a great idea. So if any of you have any information that you feel that you would like to add to this, because you're going to get a copy of this slide deck, please do so on that particular um, slide. Yeah, just let us know. Um, okay. So that was our assignment that we created to kind of help us get through uh, our drama because we had to go, you know, we've been kind of living in the math world for the last little bit. So um, we thought this would be a good way to force ourselves to get a little bit more out there, Mr. Nago. Okay, <laughs> um, this is why we'll wait for our, uh, my internet to catch up. There, is there any questions or anything out there, team? No, we are, uh, we are good at the moment. <laughs> intermediate folks don't like to ask a lot of questions it's okay it's okay we, we we also have uh we have an on-demand audience as well so we're just gonna we're gonna march forward yeah well maybe we're not gonna march forward because i don't see oh here we go perfect okay so um this is kind of where we left off now hopefully this slide makes a little bit more sense to you but the children and the animals in the woodlots all right so here we are back here at our triangulation of data. How do we know what students know? So like this is, we want to kind of make this visible about what the thinking was that led to this, uh, is that how do we collect all of these three pieces of information as we're going through this process? So we're going to get observations based on that slide deck. We're going to be monitoring as they're working. Um, we're going to have their final product and we're also going to have conversations through the brainstorming and through um, you know, the Google Meet where people are sharing their feelings and how that how that feeling looks. Um, but what was kind of neat here what we were thinking about is that often the product doesn't tell us a whole lot. We don't know the thinking that led to that product. So sometimes we'll see kids, we'll see an answer in math, but we don't know what thinking led them there. So the product by itself isn't useful. We actually have to have the product and the conversation. So, you know, we often talk about conversations, observations, and products as separate things, but they are often interwoven, right? And is that like often our observations lead to conversations? Is that I noticed that you were doing this? Can you tell us more about that? And then that engages us into the conversation piece. So there's just a, the, you know, they're not silos in and of themselves, they are interrelated. And we often need 
another point on, on, on this triangle to have the full picture. Awesome. Okay, so um, we talked quite a bit about this article last week in our sessions and we mentioned a few times too last spring we were talking and the whole point was that this is you know your student-centered online learning so Tina and I put a lot of thought into why a Google slide and and we've, we've touched base on all of those and then you can probably come up with a whole bunch more on yourself we also do realize there's limitations on that but we thought for the most part most mm -hmm. students can um, be able to manage that one quick thing we thought we would share with you today is the last little bit from this article is the kind of the building blocks of a lesson. So on the next two slides, it, sh it gives you kind of some ideas that you can use in your lesson, different formats of teaching. So if you, you know, thought the assignment was a great idea, but you don't like how we get to go to Google slide, maybe you want to do from a different approach, maybe you want to look at discussions. Maybe there's some kind of an article out there that you come across where it talks about um, how, you know, the animals are, are becoming, um, moving their habitats because of too many playgrounds are being put in, I don't know, whatever. And so maybe you want to talk that, have that conversation with your students kind of together as a whole class. And I think that um, kind of where we are right now, just for teachers that are moving into remote learning, is that like, I know how I would do this in the classroom. I need help figuring out how I will do it now in the online environment. So we thought that this was an interesting or maybe a helpful um, tool uh, to start thinking about is, okay, so in the classroom, like we do some direct instruction in the classroom, you know, I always have discussions. So how do I do that now when I'm in, in an online environment? Um, you know, how do kids do research when it's like, you know, when they're on their own now? Um, those are all things that we, we are kind of thinking about and like these are ideas that we think uh, we'd like to get into a little bit deeper as we uh, as we move forward in our sessions over the next few weeks. Um, and you know your feedback will be really valuable about whether or not this is something that's necessary or, or, or valuable. So, um, you know, like when like planning for collaboration, it, you know, uh, Kristen brought up like you, you, you know. Um, you know, we like collaboration, but it's more difficult and it needs to be planned maybe more intentfully um, than, you know, than maybe we've been doing so far. Well I think like, a collaboration task, it goes back to your establishing your rules, your routines, and your expectations that you probably have to revisit just as you would in a classroom, right? You have to go back and revisit those, those kind of classroom rules and expectations that you created together. Some folks need to have a reminder every now and again of, of, of what's expected of them. And, and I anticipate that's probably quite common online as well. Um, but I, you know, the one thing that I got out of this article and from talking with our virtual teachers last year in, or last week is, and is the engagement piece variety, right? Keep things simple online. You have to keep kids engaged in order for them to have some learning. I'm not sure if you, if Kristen or Stasha have any little tidbits of information they could offer us on that. I just, I think you said it there with keeping it simple, right? Like in the beginning, I was definitely overdoing it and the kids were not keeping up. They can't, even if they're using Google Read and Write, navigating all their work online. Um, and a lot of them are home for various reasons or have a lot going on at home, which does also make it challenging. I mean, think about us, like I'm working from home with my kids and my husband and, you know, it is hard to stay on task sometimes. So, so by making the tasks more straightforward and you might even find them even to be boring because it's not something you would do, something exciting you would do in person is um, you'll find it's beneficial because it's, it's kind of like peeling away all the extra stuff, like, and it's just here it is. So, mm -hmm. those yeah. are great points. Yeah. Wait time. I was gonna say, that I know I've said this thing. before about, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, okay, I was gonna say, I know I've said this before about Google Slides, but how, like you said, it's a live document. So, constantly you're on 
you know, I'll constantly be flipping through their work and uh, giving them feedback right over our meet. I'll be like, oh, or I'll say, I don't see you working on your document because you could see them on, right? So, you know, it's not like I'm assigning them something and they go off and do it, right? Where it's kind of like we're live together, right? We're in, they're working on their work and I'm right there. I'll have a meet open for questions and it's just, I, that keeps them engaged, right? Knowing that I'm, I'm checking on them, right? Mm -hmm. For sure. And, well, the one thing I was going to say, and I, I, I tried to do it last week and I'm still working on it is, is the wait time. And it's hard to do when you're in a person to person conversation. Uh, it's, it's even harder to do uh, when you're online. And we saw it happen a few times here today. You know, everybody's internet may be a little bit slow. Somebody's might be a little bit more laggy. And so, you know, you have a couple of people kind of talk at the same time, but if we, if we really practice on being intentional and giving that wait time, it allows the students time to actually think about what you're asking them to do. And then it gives them time to, to gather a response or type of response in the chat. And then it also just, uh, you know, allows the server not having a whole bunch of people talking at once. Right. All right. So Learning we're coming up on the- uh, huge. Yeah, so just uh, here's the, if uh, for those of you that are, that are um, still supporting families that are having tech issues, you can uh, kind of offload that to our student IT support. Uh, we shared this link before, but here it is again, just in case you uh, need it. And we just have some things to. Um... Yeah, so we're just kind of reiterating our points there. I think that uh, we were able to nail those. Mm -hmm. um, and again, we did a drama one, but we, we feel confident that this could be kind of a, the state, same stepping stones that you would take with, with um, any assignment or anything that you're trying to think your way through. And just as we close things off here, I think it's important to, again, be flexible and be adaptable. And it's okay to stop something and, and try and find um, a go around or a work around and make sure everybody's on the same page. And I, I, I don't think we have any questions, but I'll just put that out there in case. No, any. but uh, there are, if, if you are watching this uh, on demand, um, we are available. Um, you can email us, send us a, a message on Twitter. Um, everyone kind of in the LKDSB knows our email addresses. So please reach out if, uh, if you're in, you know, if you're looking for any advice or tips, especially from Nastasha or Kristen, they're, uh, they're pros, please, uh, please reach out. Um, these are, so if you're looking for our show notes, uh, they are, I'll post those in the chat as well as uh, our next session will be coming up next Tuesday, uh, January 19th at 3.30 p.m. Uh, hope that you'll be able to join us. Uh, until then, please take care of yourselves and each other. And thank you for joining us and for Kristen and Nastasha. Thank you for bringing your wealth of knowledge and expertise. And um, hopefully we'll see you back again next Tuesday at 3.30, ladies. I would appreciate it. Thank you. And team, thank you very much for another session. Thank you, and Denise. It was always a pleasure. Everybody has a great <laughs> night. Thank you to and the magician behind the curtain, uh, Rod, as well. <laughs> yes. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night. Take care.